Hello, welcome to Forest Focus. It's the business end of the season now with Nottingham Forest Premier League future on the line in the next three games. Going to discuss what the Reds' chances of staying up in what is sure to be a nerve-jangling final few weeks is TNT Sports commentator Adam Summerton. Adam, good to have you with us. How are you doing? I'm really good. Thanks for the invite. How are you? Uh, yeah, good, good. I, I've, I've been trying to get you on for a while, but uh, quite since the Fulham game, actually, uh, we were talking about that before we recorded, but you are like the busiest man in football. So yeah, I, I'm glad you're with us. You must be permanently knackered at this time of the season. <laughs> it is a really busy time, yeah, um, with the European matches and, and we've had the National League playoffs this week as well. But a- April's always that month where I know that I'm just going to sort of just have to dig deep and get get through. I mean, it's not like being down in mine, though, is it? I mean, it's a pretty pretty good job to be doing. But yeah, you pretty much sort of prep, game, travel, and, you know, it's just repeat, rinse and repeat, really, for April. But it's it's grateful. This is a difficult question to answer. Roughly how many games do you commentate on a season, would you say? Um, that is a good question. I would say it's got to be definitely over 100, I would say, probably... 120 something like that some that's just I'm plucking that right off the top of my head but yeah you, people always ask me how many a week it is um I'd say you, you tend to average probably about three a week I always think four is absolutely you're on your right to your well me personally right to your limit of what you're capable of in terms of keeping up with the prep as well I always find two is nice I've got two this week so it's a slightly easier week this week but I'd say three is probably the average during the season yeah What's a week look like prep wise then? How many? I've seen you, people ask you this on Twitter. I think you've addressed it before, but you, it's pretty detailed, isn't it? And are uh, you know you labour intensive as well? I guess. Yeah, you, you're pretty much. Well, I, I personally, I'm usually juggling two or three games at a time, and um, so I might spend the morning researching a Champions League game and the afternoon researching a National League game. So I'm constantly taking one hat off and putting another on, and um, yeah, you, you're just constantly juggling it, but. Um, yeah, the, the, the kind of labours of love is one way of putting it, really. I really enjoy the, the prep and it's quite geeky because you sit here on your own. It's you, you do have to, it's a lot of self-motivation involved because, of course, you know, you've got to do the prep. I always find that the confident that you, you gain confidence from knowledge and then that confidence then hopefully leads to on-air authority, if you like, which people expect from a commentator. I think very often people just expect you to know absolutely everything about every, the, the teams you're covering, which is fair enough. Um, so I to, I always maybe go a, a lot further than perhaps you even need to, just so that you've got that information there, even if you don't need it, because a lot of it sort of ends up, up on the cutting room floor, really. You don't use maybe half of it, two-thirds of it sometimes. You might use it uh, again in a subsequent match so there might be stuff there that won't completely go to waste but you've got it there if you need it and you don't obviously it's unscripted isn't it sports so you don't know who's going to be a main protagonist uh who isn't you might have some great lines on a player who doesn't even play or comes on for five minutes and you know all that work just never sees the light of day but then there'll be a day when it that player's the star man on, on the pitch and and you really do use it. So Morgan Rogers was an example of that the other night doing the, the Villa game. I'd, I'd done a lot on him because I'd never watched him play before. So I'd really gone to town on, on him individually and then he scored. So it was great for me because I had lo- all these lovely lines. Well, I thought they were lovely anyway. Nice lines on him. So, um, yeah, it's 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 a lot of work, it's solitary work as well. But uh, I always find it pays off. I bet you were glad he scored. Yeah, he not had a kick until he scored in that game as well. <laughs> yeah. <watching> this <laughs> it's in, come on, Morgan. <laughs> <laughs> um, I know you're obviously you know you're all around the country, all around Europe. But have you got Nottingham connections already? I think you. Oh yeah, here at least. yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I moved to Nottingham when I was 19 to go to university at Trent. I studied broadcast journalism there. Um, I was there for three years and then I briefly moved back home to the Northwest when I finished, basically because I was skint uh, to, and lived with mum and dad for six months. But while I'd been at university, I'd met my, she's now my ex-wife, but but was my girlfriend at the time. Um, and she, was, she wasn't she was a student. She was from Nottingham. She was from Woolerton. And um, so I wanted to come back to be with her, move back. And we had children together and I've just stayed in the area ever since. Um, so I've actually lived in this area, across the East Midlands, Nottinghamshire and Derbyshire. But I've lived here longer than I've actually lived where I'm originally from. So, uh, yeah, definitely big, big connection to the area. I'm, I'm talking to you from Nottingham now. 
Ah, okay. Well, you're winning people over before you even discuss Forest, so that's good. That's a good start. Um, one of the reasons I like to get commentators on, like Darren Fletcher's on here a lot, Seb Hutchinson's a regular guest. It's just because you watch so much football, so it's good to get kind of a neutral perspective on on our team. What have you made of Forest this season when you've seen them? You, can you understand why they are where they are or not? Well, it's funny you should say that because the one game that I've commentated on Forest for TNT this season was the Fulham game. And I came away from there. It actually, it's one of the games I've enjoyed, the, one of the domestic games I've enjoyed the most this season. I love the atmosphere because having having lived in the city or around the city for so long, I'd, I'd, I'd still, I don't know how, it, it just never done a, a Forest game at the city ground, believe it or not. I just don't know how it had kept back passing me by. But I hadn't done one, so I'd always wanted to experience the atmosphere, the famous atmosphere, and I absolutely loved it. It was brilliant. A really good game. I thoroughly enjoyed it. And I came away from there just thinking, how's this team in you know the trouble that they are? Because I looked across the pitch, and, and I, it was one of those nights where I thought every single player was at least a 7 out of 10. Some of them were 8s and 9s. I mean, Danilo that night was unbelievable. I thought Gibbs White was just another level to anyone else on the pitch, probably. Um, the fullbacks were both excellent. You could see why Murillo has, has been getting a lot of praise this season too. So Yates is just ridiculous how, how much work that guy puts in. I thought Wood led the line well. He had the threat on the wings of hudson Adoy and Alanga. Uh, yeah, and I just came away thinking, I'm really confused having not watched them every week as to how they are. were they. I mean, admittedly, Fulham weren't great that night. So you have to take the opposition into consideration. But uh, I, I suspect... And when you look at some of the players involved in their career paths, I suspect consistency is the issue, both individually and collectively, in that they are capable of a performance like that individually and collectively, but they're also capable across the piece of those levels dipping. And that's maybe why, you know, some of these players, when you look at their careers, that they've maybe talent-wise got the ability to be at clubs who are in the European positions, but maybe haven't been able to do it enough consistently. I'm not talking about the whole squad there, but some of them you, know, you, you could probably pick out the guys that that would apply to. So maybe that's the case. You'd know better than me, but that that's that's maybe what the theory I've, I've come up with, having watched them be so good against Fulham. Yeah, I mean, after that game, I remember David Prutton made that point that this is why they are where they are, that lack of consistency. And when you watch Premier League games, do you think the teams at the bottom to win a game you probably have to have most players at least a seven out of ten. You can't carry passengers when, and sometimes when you like Man City or Arsenal, you can probably get away with one or two who aren't quite at it because the others are so good. But when you're down the bottom, I guess, do you need that level of consistency across the team to actually win matches? Because it's so hard to win a Premier League game, I think. It is, and the, and the I cover a lot of leagues and always have done across Europe, and the level of intensity in in the Premier League is. I'd say probably unrivaled, really. I mean, people sometimes still think that leagues like Serie A are very slow and defensive. The, the reality is that they they just aren't anymore. I mean, Serie A is, you get a lot of goals in Serie A, you get a lot of attacking football, where somewhere like Serie A is different to the Premier League is that it's more tactical um, and, and less off the cuff. I'm not saying there's the, there isn't tactics used in the Premier League, but it's a big, a lot of the English players or British players who've gone to Italy do say that's what they learn the most in Italy is the tactical side of the game. So um, I think that that intensity and energy that's demanded in Premier League games, um, I suppose you could say that's that's the easier thing to to, to maintain rather than the, the, the technical consistency. Um but yeah, I think it. Yeah, it's got to be a factor, and I suppose the further you drop down the division, the the more that that's going to become a problem. I mean, you look at the the points that the the sides in the bottom end of the table. I mean, it's probably going to be a record low points tally this time, isn't it? That that keeps mm. the the team who stays out of it up. I mean, twenty six points from seventy uh, from thirty five games, seventeenth place. Forest, and then you've got Luton just behind them, a point behind them. I mean, I I still think that Forest should get safe but it's it's tighter than i expected and and of course i'm sure you'll probably talk about it but we've got the whole points deduction thing that comes into it as well which really muddies the waters doesn't it for everybody mm -hmm. um and that that's that's a factor as well in, in psychological factor and that's a big thing in when you're looking to fight the drop isn't it that that mental side the psychological side of it and how how does that affect a team and a club and and those trying to overhaul them as well um, just before we come back to that, you mentioned Syria. I shout out curiosity: Have you seen much of Freuler this season in Syria? Remo Freuler. Not seen. I've not seen a lot of him this season, but I did see a lot of him before he went to Forest. And when he went mm -hmm. to Forest, I, I thought, I thought two things. 
on what I'd seen of him at Atalanta, he was part of a really good collective unit and he was an absolute bargain. I think they paid about a million euro for him. Um, and for what they got out of him, he was one of the best signings I've probably ever seen in Serie A in terms of the levels he reached, the team that he played in. Um, I'm always slightly wary of any club that signs a player who's played for Gasparini or, in, or comes from a Gasparini team straight to another team because his system, as you, you might have seen if you watch the Liverpool game, it's it's very particular. Um, it's, it's a little uncommon. It's man marking all over the pitch. And very often, not very often, but sometimes when you take a player out of his um, very specific ways of doing things, the tactical demands that he sets... Players can sometimes struggle or take a while to adapt to something completely different. So I'm always mindful of of that. Um, so how, how would you say, I'm interested actually, to, how do you think he, he did? I mean, there's not a great body of work there to go by, is there? No, I think we came away thinking good player, but not a good player in this team, the Steve Cooper mm. team. He didn't, yeah. he didn't fit the way we played. Um, not the most athletic. Uh, and he probably needed athleticism in midfield. We've had other players like that, like Gustavo Scarpa, we signed from Brazilian football, and he didn't really cut the mustard physically. And I think maybe uh, maybe that's a big thing in the Premier League, isn't it? Like, central midfield just now in the Premier League, like, if you're not athletic, I don't think you cut it, do you? Unless you're exceptionally good, I, I just don't think you cut it, really. Yeah, I mean, it, the, the athletic demands are, are, I mean, that's, you know, I pick up on on Yates in that Fulham game. I mean, the amount of ground that he covered, um, I think Martin Keown that night described him. There was one, there was this, we got this slow-mo of him leaping in the air and he said he looks like a stuntman. That's kind of how he played. He was just throwing himself about and, you know, the absolutely dripping in sweat, the lad. And wow, I mean, I'm not going to sit here and say I think he's the most technically gifted footballer, but you won't find many that work as hard, will you? Or certainly mm. on the evidence of, of that night anyway. So, um, yeah, I think there's still room for those technical players. Um, undoubtedly there is, but the the energy levels, the intensity, the physicality, yeah, absolutely. It, it is really important in the, in the Premier League. And, you know, Danilo is is somebody who, and I know he's he's been inconsistent this season and, and does seem to blow a bit hot and cold. But again, to go back to that Fulham game, I saw so much potential in him. In fact, I'd seen him playing in the Club World Cup final against Chelsea, um, and I'd seen a little bit of him in Brazil. And I thought, yeah, there's a player there. And I thought that again coming away from the Fulham game, that he he's somebody who I think could, in time, um, become a fantastic Premier League player. But Again, you're far better placed than I to, to judge. I, th I think consistency probably has been a problem, but then it's been a problem across the piece for Forrest, hasn't it? Yeah, he does tend to go good game, bad game, particularly home versus away. He seems to play better at home than he, he does away. And now we've got these big games coming up. He's going to need to to perform. But yesterday he played with Maud Gibbs White in a two, and that was a bit of a departure. And I thought it actually worked quite well because they really got about Man City. So that, that might work well. I mean, what do you think about this Sheffield United game that we've got now? Because it feels like we have to win nothing else will do unless we get lucky and other results really go for us maybe a draw is enough but yeah how's the psychology of that one play out with them already being down do you think well you never quite know whether it with a relegated team do you whether it just totally relaxes them they come out and play some of their best football of the season or to use that old cliche they're on the beach you just don't know do you i suppose if you look at it in terms of Chris Wilder is going to be staying there for next season, he's going to be assessing players, who he wants to keep, who he wants to move on. So from that perspective, the, the players that want to stay there are going to be really wanting to put it in, aren't they, to make sure that they're part of the plans for next season. There'll be some players there who can't wait to get away, probably. Some of them might even have moves already in the pipeline. So it'll be a real mixed bag, won't it, in terms of Sheffield United as to their their focus, their mentality as to where they are. But I look player for player across the pitch and I, I think Forrest should, should beat them. And, you know, they, they, there's good players at Forrest. You know, you, you, you can't spend the amount of money that they have done and, and not have some decent players. I mean, they really, they have got good players. I really like the the goalkeeper, what I've seen of him. I've seen of him playing in, in Europe as well. I haven't mentioned him so far, but, you know, player for player, Forest are more than good enough, more than good enough to, to beat Sheffield United and more than good enough to stay up. Um, but I suppose when you're down there and when you've been down there for so long and when you've got this added factor of the points deduction as well, sometimes groups of players, you struggle to sort of see the wood for the trees, if you like. You almost need that drone type view of the whole situation and the squad rather than that ground floor situation and look at it from above and look and think, well, you know what, actually, if you look at us player for player, we should be 
we really should be beating a, a team like this, particularly when the pressure's on and and we really need to deliver. So, and it's a perhaps a I always I am a glass half full kind of kind of person usually, but I do look and I just think, yeah, they should be beating them. They really should. I mean, you're someone like Morgan Gibbs White in your team as well, the X factor and that he brings, the difference that he can make. Um, get him on the ball as much as possible. It surely will be the instruction, I would have thought. I think so. I think so. I mean, do you think the bottom three are that bad compared to what we've seen previously? I know Forrest are only a point above it, so they've hardly had a stellar season, but it feels like a particularly bad season for the, the bottom teams in terms of quality that might be a, a, you know the saving grace for Forrest in a way. What I see when I look at the situation it's, as it's developed over the years is something that I compare actually because I cover the National League as well and I'm in this constant, uh, almost constant debate with people about three up, three down from the National League. And, and one of the things people do is that they'll look at the prom- teams that have been promoted from the National League and they'll say, you know, oh, well, they're not challenging to go up to, to League Two. So, you know, are they good enough? Or can we be having an extra place? And I think, well, OK, so if you're applying that standard, look at the teams that come up from the Championship to the Premier League and nobody ever, ever says we should only have two coming up from the championship because the clubs coming up aren't good enough. You'd never hear somebody say that, would you? But what we're getting now is a situation where I think the gap is getting bigger and bigger. And as evidenced by the fact that you look at the three teams who came up last season are the three teams who I think will go down. And, you know, we've already already lost Sheffield United. So the gap is getting bigger. Um, and perhaps there needs to be a bit more conversation about, you know, how uncomfortable is that for the the pyramid system? Uh, how uncomfortable is that? And do what can we do to try and redress the balance a bit? Because I don't know about you, but the way things are at the moment, you could see that gap getting even bigger. There will always be the the sort of the side that's got that massive amount of momentum from going up, and um, a particularly good championship side that does then kick on again. But it just feels for me, and I, I could well be proved wrong. I hope I am actually. But it just feels for me that that gap is getting bigger. Um, and I, it concerns me a bit as to, you know, you could end up with just these perennial yo-yo clubs that benefit from the parachute payments, come back up again, then struggle again, go back down again. So we'll see what happens. But it just it does just feel like that at the moment, that there is an ever-increasing gap between the, the top end of the Championship and the bottom end of the Premier League. I don't think it's going to change next season either, is it? Because... We, you know, we talk about points deductions. Leicester have got these financial issues that they seem to have. We'll talk of points deductions for them already. They might have to sell before they can buy even. So they're in a sticky spot. Ipswich, they've done magnificently, but can you really expect them to kick on the Premier League? And then I guess Leeds might be quite well set up because they seem to loan a lot of their, their players out. So it, it might be here again next season, I guess. Yeah. The, the sides that come up, have, and it's a great point you make there, they've got to be so creative in terms of how they build their squads when they go into the Premier League because they can't spend too much now because of all the FFP situations. So they're a little hamstrung in that respect. Um, but they've got to do enough that they manage to stay up. It's a really, really fine balance, isn't it, for these clubs as to how they maintain the squad. By the way, just in case anybody's thinking I'm advocating for less promotion places from the championship. I'm not saying that. I'm just comparing it to the people's attitude or some people's attitude towards the National League. And they say, well, you know, if they can't, if they're not challenging for promotion again, what are they doing in, in League Two? So I'm just making that comparison. But um, yeah, certainly, you know, you never question, I wouldn't question three up from the championship, but it does worry me a little bit about how we're going to see teams become established again in the Premier League. And that's, I mean, that is what Forest right now are trying to do, isn't it? They're trying to become established again. I mean, I suppose you could argue as to how many seasons you've got to be in the Premier League before you can earn that tag of being established again back in the, the top flight. But it's exceptionally difficult to do now, isn't it? To go from the Championship, stay up in that first season. Very often teams, if they do, it's by the skin of their teeth and then kick on again. Um, we've seen teams who've done it and then ended up eventually dropping out. But um yeah, and that and that's another reason why it's absolutely you know these next weeks are massive for Forest, aren't they? In terms of staying up. So, do you have sympathy then for Forest plight when it comes to the points deduction because they did overspend, but then if they hadn't spent a lot of money, they probably would have been Sheffield United. So, where are you at on that? Is it a bit fifty fifty for you? Well, I've, I've got yeah. I mean, I've got a lot of thoughts in my head about that whole situation with points deductions, and I mean, I just. I look at it and I just think it just makes me a bit just 
thoroughly uncomfortable that we're seeing so many things well, potentially decided on not entirely on sporting merit. I mean, to, again, to go back to the National League that I cover, I mean, we have two teams this season who should have been in the playoffs and had had unbelievable seasons, Southend and Gateshead. And for off-the-pitch reasons, neither of them are in and thoroughly, for on-the-pitch reasons, deserve to be in. 46-game seasons. Um, and I don't know. I mean, Gateshead was because of an issue with their ground and, and Southend because of... They were put into administration, financial problems and whatnot. But it just doesn't sit easy with me that we have these situations where clubs are being docked points. And I'm not sitting here pretending to know all the answers. I'm not saying that, you know, I've got this solution and this would be a better way of doing it. But I, I just feel as a football fan, first and foremost, not as a fan of any of the teams that I'm talking about, I put myself in the position of those fans who are going week in, week out. They're paying a lot of money these days to watch football. It's a lot of travel. It's a lot of commitment. Even when you, you take the financial side for the clubs out of it and the effect on the players too, for things not to be decided entirely on sporting merit, I don't know. It just it just doesn't sit well with me. But then, you know, I suppose another someone else might say, yeah, but they knew the rules and if they've overspent, they, that that is the punishment. So I can see all sides of it. But yeah, I just... I don't know. It, it, just, it just makes me uneasy. I don't know, I don't know about you. I, it's just the, the whole sporting merit side of things for me has to be absolutely... Sacrosanct is the right word, but it, it, it has to be first and foremost. And we just can't have a situation where a team could not even still know after the final game of the season how many points they've got. I mean, it's just... It's just ludicrous. I mean, it really is ludicrous. I mean, how can that happen? So I'm not saying Forrest haven't done anything wrong. I'm not saying Forrest don't deserve to have a punishment. Um, I'm trying to see all sides of it, but I, I just keep going back. I know to that it just really makes me uneasy that that we have this situation. I mean, it's a, and I, I I use that word I'd like ludicrous, ludicrous that we can get to the end of the season and a team still can't know because of appeals where they stand. I, I think yeah. I just think that's absolutely crazy. It just feels like a really dated system to me, FFP, because the, the 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 loss figures are like 13 years old. They haven't been adjusted. So there's there's that. There's the whole Man City and Chelsea thing. Like Chelsea are able to sell hotels. If you read it, it was reported in the Telegraph to, to stay on the right side of it. The City thing's a minefield, obviously, with 115 charges. That's going to be litigated for, I suspect, years, actually, before that's resolved. Um so yeah, it doesn't it doesn't feel right. Is the football fans now are studying spreadsheets as much as they are, you know, these exactly, yeah. and formations. And that's and that's what I don't like. I mean, I remember somebody in football once saying to me years ago, this you know, we were just talking about our love of the game, and they said, you know, if you knew behind the scenes, I'm not talking about school duggery here, I'm just talking about the way things are behind the scenes in football. They they just said you wouldn't like it as much. You know, it's such a horrible business at times. And um yeah, I, I just, I just think we want to be focusing on on what's going on on the pitch. We don't want fans, and and what it also does is it, it fuels anger, it fuels conspiracy theories, it fuels a, a mistrust. When, as you've pointed to there, people will say, "Well, what about them?" and and what about this? And they've spent that, and that shouldn't be what sports should be about. It it, it should just be about the enjoying the the action on the pitch, and if and if. After the 38 games of a season, you've not been good enough and you, you deserve to go down, then everybody can accept that. But I think what we're doing now is in football in this country is we're moving into the realms of where you know, a side will go down and it will just be continually contested. If it's not about VAR and refereeing decisions, it'll be about, well, they spent this and why has that not been taken into account? And it just makes me feel so uncomfortable. It's not what the game that I grew up to love. It's not what it was about. And I don't want it to be about that going forward. Now, again, I'm not sitting here saying this is the solution. This is what should change. But it it just feels like it's it just doesn't feel right. And, and I really hope that we can get past this period and things can get sorted out and ironed out. Um, but I don't hold out too much hope about that, I have to say. Uh, just before we go from one controversial subject to another, then a quick word for our sponsor, the Trent Navigation. You can see Rick Parfit Jr. and his band on Saturday, the 11th of May, straight after the Chelsea game. Should be uh, hopefully an end of season party, but we shall see very much on that. Uh, free entry and you can get food in the barbecue court and uh, drinks inside and out. So thanks to them for their support as ever. Right. Uh, yeah, on to another controversial subject then, talking about how the game is in, in VAR. 
Um, what's your take on it? Because I think I'm right in saying commentators can hear more than what's happening in their ears than fans, which might give you a slightly different slant on it. But what's your view on VAR? Because it seems like an all-time low in terms of trust in it now amongst fans. Yeah, we hear everything that's said um, via VAR to the referee. So we're able to communicate to supporters what the VAR is saying to the referee in terms of instructions or maybe they'll explain to the referee why something shouldn't, they don't need to be go over and check something. So yeah, and I have to say when you, you have access to that audio, it really shows me how much it would help the viewing public if they had that access to the audio as well. And I think it would help to take away some of the mistrust that there is of, of the whole system right now. So I would like to see, and, and I've thought this for a while, I would like to see that the, the VAR is made available to the television companies and the radio companies. And I think that that would help with the situation because the levels of mistrust just, and I, I'm always wary of how much notice I take of, of Twitter and X, but that's, you know, that's, if we're honest, that's where a lot of the reactions to these things come from. And, you know, they're, they're just alive with, with, with conspiracy theories seemingly after every game at the moment. So I think that that would help with that. Um, in terms of VAR over, overall, I was actually sat before a game I did yesterday with some ex-footballers and, and other people as well. And we were we were talking about VAR and, and I just sort of sat back and I, th I thought to myself and I said, I've, I feel like I've got to the point now where I've previously been in favour of quite a watered down version of VAR a very light touch VAR, but I think now I've got to the point where I think the game's better off without it. I really mm. do. I think that, but I'd, I'd have to caveat that by saying that if we, if we did move to a situation like they're doing in Sweden, where there is no VAR, the mindset and the mentality of football fans, there has to be a shift there to the two things that they have to go hand in hand. So we, as football supporters, we have to say, in our own minds and collectively into each other, look, we have to accept that referees are occasionally going to get something wrong. We have to accept that that will occasionally go against our team. And when that happens, we can't then be screaming for VAR to come back and we can't be constantly screaming conspiracy, cheats, all this kind of thing. So it would require, and you know, the, what's happened in Sweden actually really does open up the possibility. I, I still don't think it will happen, by the way, but it, it makes it more likely than it was that there could be a rebellion across the piece where more associations say, do you know what, actually, we're going to move away from this. It, it really, it's an experiment that's gone on for a long time now and, and, and it hasn't worked. It hasn't made the game better. And I feel sorry the, mo the most for the fans who are at the stadium. I mean, some of these fans are paying, what, 60 60 quid for a ticket and they've no idea what's going on when a goal has been scored. I mean, that's, it's, it's just ridiculous, isn't it? That you can pay that much money to go and watch something and you're less informed than somebody who's watching it on TV at home. So it is a bit of a mess. And the one thing that I hate the most as well is this, is this constant now thing. And again, it, it is social media led. So you do have to take it with a pinch of salt, but it just feels like now every week I'm seeing more and more times where we're seeing this words corrupt and we're seeing these words conspiracy associated with, with refereeing decisions. And I only wind back a few years and I always used to think, cause I cover a lot of Italian football and in Italian football for a long time, the presumption it always felt was that the referee was was dodgy, not that the referee was was clean. That was almost the presumption. I mean, re refereeing controversies in Italy, with foundation, by the way, because there have been there have been incidents in Italy. But that was almost like you felt like the referee. The starting point with referees was what they, that they were on the take or something, whereas obviously they're not. Um, in the vast majority of the cases, anyway. But the, the I always felt in this country we had more of a, an implicit trust of our referees that we would say, well, that's a bad decision. That's that's incompetence. Very rarely heard people say that they're they're a cheat, they're they're on the take, or there is a conspiracy against my team. In the, I've certainly noticed in the last few years, and it's tied in with VAR. Actually, they coincided into how this happened. It's coincided as well with a complete degeneration in terms of um, the way that society online works and i look to politics as well and you know the the, the trump era in in the states where it was almost like you could say anything you liked and it didn't matter i can say whatever i like about anyone i like and there's no comeback 
who I, I can say they're a cheat. I've got no evidence that they have. I can't prove it, but I can ruin that person's reputation because it benefits me to say they're a cheat. And, and I think what we've got now, and it, it spreads into all aspects of life, is that people can, do just think that they can say, accuse anyone of whatever they like with no with no comeback. And I do think that plays a part in the reaction that we're seeing, particularly online, to, to some of the incidents we've had in, in, in football of late. And um, I, again, a little bit like uh, the, the whole FFP thing, it just really makes me sad because I just don't think that's what it should be about. And, you know, being a commentator, I've not felt it the same as an official will do. But, but we are constantly accused, all commentators. You know, I, I can look at a Twitter feed of, you know, on any given game and you, can, you could see a commentator accused of being thoroughly biased to both teams at the same time. You know, that's happened to me. And that, that's the ridiculousness of it. And I don't know why people think that sometimes that, that people who've worked unbelievably hard in an unbelievably competitive industry to get to a position where, you know, that, that they're working, whether it be a commentator or a referee on the Premier League, that people think that they would give all that up to favour one team over another that they don't care less about M boggles my mind. That someone thinks that I would be biased to another team and sacrifice potentially, you know, if it was proven that I had this bias, that I would sacrifice my whole career and my, all my integrity to favour one football team over another. It's, it's lunacy when you when you boil it down like that. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't see corruption. I know a lot of Forest fans are seeing it and it's really filtered in the last week, but I think like Liverpool are probably a good case in point. They, they've had decisions this season. We've had awful decisions at Forest. I could reel them off. But if you look at Liverpool, they had that goal against Spurs that was ruled out for offside when the VAR just fell apart. Then they had the one against us where the ball was dropped wrongly in their favour and they scored. We should have cleared it, but you know that benefit them. And then at the weekend, Anthony Taylor's like, stopping play for no reason when uh, Gakpo's about to score. I mean, I just think that the the level of officiating has become so up and down. Well, poor, actually. I think it's been so bad this season. But it was interesting at Forest yesterday. I don't know if you saw much of the game, but it filtered through in terms of the crowd. Uh, the Premier League theme tune came on and everyone booed it. Gary Neville was getting chants about him. It feels like it was a bit of a watershed in terms of the mistrust filtering through. But you mentioned earlier about how you change it a, a bit. I mean, are you just going all the way down to uh, goal line technology and automated offsides then, or would you just get rid of everything bar that? Definitely goal line technology, and I'm, I'm a little undecided on the automated offsides because, again, I just feel like the way the offside... I mean, the automated offside in Serie A, again, which I cover a lot, it's actually worked quite well because we had an incident before it was brought in in Serie A where a Juventus scored. I can't remember if it was an equaliser or a winner. It was very late on in a game. And basically a player who was over towards the, the corner flag, um, the, the, it just been missed. They'd just been completely missed. I think they were playing somebody on size and the, the, they'd look back at it in VAR and they'd just not seen him because he, was, he wasn't in the thick of the action, if you like. Uh, and so that was obviously something that would solve that. Uh, so it has worked reasonably well in Italy in that the and other leagues too in that the decisions have been come to more quickly. So from that side of the things, people get frustrated about the speed of the decision making. In that respect, you know you've not got all the lines being drawn and you've not got that delay. So it does work in that respect. But again, you go back to is it in the spirit of of what the rule was brought in for in the first place that if it's seen the you know, players got an advantage, haven't they? If they're half a yard in front, they've got an advantage. If somebody's a toe in front is that really is that in the spirit of it is that an advantage but you know it's exceptionally difficult for i mean i don't know if you've ever i don't know if you've got kids but i have and i've i've run the line at their games i tell you what it isn't easy <laughs> to spot you know when we took when we're talking those distances so it always used to be look give the slight benefit of the doubt to the attacker didn't that was all always how it was described so i'm i'm not i've not made my mind up if i'm honest on the semi automated offsides because i can see the merit of it and i can see how it's not quite in the spirit of things but in terms of yeah goal line technology and also i think there would need to be a mechanism in place for mistaken identity because you can't have a situation where everybody watching the game including you know fourth official and everybody knows the referee's made a mistake but they can't tell them i mean that's just that's just silly so we'd have to have that kind of mechanism mechanism in place but i do think i do think when you ask but i mean i just did a you know, asked the people in the room yesterday that I was with and everybody said they would rather if they didn't have it. Mm, and and I yeah. and I commentate on games where there is VAR and not VAR. And 
I must admit that when you know that a goal has been scored, you just know a goal has been scored. You know, you, you're not looking, you're not waiting for that moment. And and sometimes when I'm doing a Premier League game, you are, there is in the back of the ma- your mind, you're thinking, oh, is that going to get ruled out? And I think sometimes referees, maybe even if it's just subconscious, are perhaps relying on VAR as a safety net. And I say subconsciously, mm-hmm. I'm not sure that they would go out and do it purposely, but it's got to affect the referees, hasn't it? Psychologically, to think there is that layer of backup if they've got it wrong. So, whether it's affecting their decision making too, I, I just think we've it's been a very long, detailed experiment now, and the the appetite of the fans for it and those within the game does seem to have have gone now. But you know, you you know that if they took it away, first week no VAR, a team loses because of a goal that was I don't know debatable people will be screaming for it to come back so that's why i say there's got to be this change of mindset as football supporters you've got to say look we've got to give these guys and just cut them a little bit of slack and in the current environment of mistrust i'm not sure how all of these things come together to get the game to where it needs to be it's it's all it's all a bit of a mess at the minute it is it is it was interesting have you seen that chelsea v spurs clip that was doing the rounds on twitter of the var but a penalty appeal and offside i don't know if you have no i don't think i have no so it was interesting because um uh it was i think they got the right decision in the end but the process was very long and the thing that worrying about it is when they draw the offside lines they're literally going click a frame click a frame okay that's where the contact of the ball is fair enough and then when they draw the lines, they're going, they're literally going a bit to the right, a bit to the right, a bit to the right. It's like, oh, okay, that's close enough. Lining up with someone's ass or someone's boot or something. And it's still not it's still not completely precise. So you see poor old Cov City getting that goal ruled out. And you just mm. wonder, you know, have they drawn the lines right there? And it's still, it just still feels like such a mess to me, I think. That's and, that's a big problem. And and another one as well that people have mentioned in the past is from where the, the the moment the ball is kicked as well, you yeah. know that's that's sometimes up for debate too as to um, the impact that, that that makes and if you've got that absolutely spot on that moment of contact. So I just feel like the game that I grew up and fell in love with in the eighties and the nineties. I just it's, this isn't what it sh- should be about, is it? Talking about toes and you know drawing lines and. I understand that I mean, if, if we think back from an in, and a purely English perspective as to were this in this country, a lot of the initial clamour for this sort of thing to come in, it went back to the Lampard goal, didn't it, against Germany? At, and that mm. was, you know, it was, oh, and people said, look, that's it now. We, we can't carry on like this. We can't have in this era with all this technology available to us a situation where something like that can ever happen. So it, I think that was one of the things that really started to foster that attitude. But it's probably gone, and this is just my own view, other people's will be different. I think it's gone too far the other way now in that we're, 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 we're just going into it into so much detail. And, and it's easy to forget as well, and, and this is again where I've got sympathy for referees, is that we forget how many decisions are made on a football pitch in 90 minutes are subjective. They're not necessarily, I mean, people always say, well, you're either offside or you're not. Well, a lot of decisions are, you could have, I mean, for example, the Villa game the other night where Chelsea had that goal disallowed in added time. Just as I'm walking off the gantry, I'm walking down to where our crew are after the game. So everybody's first thing is, what do you reckon? Was it, should it have been disallowed? And I've got to say, I think it was probably, I think it was probably 60-40 in, in terms of in favour of it being ruled out. But still, you know, you see the split, you see the point I'm making is that, and, th- and this is one of the things that does make football such a fantastic sport, isn't it? The controversies, the debates, it, th- there is objectivity to it. And I don't think that, I think to lose that or to, to constantly be looking to for black and white in everything, I'm not sure that that helps the game as a spectacle either, or or feeds into what we all loved about it. And we all love the debate. I mean, there's a rate there's there's radio stations who have two hour phone ins that are just almost entirely people debating whether something was not was should have been a goal or not a goal or or whatever or should have been a penalty or not a penalty. So, I mean, I think we all like that, don't we? Don't we all like that side of football? The the sitting in the pub and chatting about stuff and arguing about stuff and I do anyway, but maybe some people just want the the, the real clarity. Uh, I thought I was a foul like, by that that Villa that Chelsea one. I thought he fouled him, but yeah, yeah. there you go. Uh, we've spoken for twenty minutes about VAR, which I didn't want to do, but it, <laughs> I think it becomes all consuming. So let's just finish by talking about um, football. What makes you, you said a couple of times now you think Forest will stay up? 
is it that just down to the individual quality you think that sets them apart enough or is there any any other reason that's a big part of it for me um i i, I rate nuno as a manager as well i know that people will probably you know when, when you look at his record so far at forest i mean I suppose people will look at it and it's mixed to say the least, isn't it? But I, I covered Wolves a lot. I covered them in Europe when he had them um, doing really well in the Europa League, got them to the quarterfinals. And I remember being really impressed with them. I remember at a time, actually, we were covering a game, I think it was in Espanyol, and the, the team were in our hotel. And I remember at that time, he was being very strongly linked with Arsenal. So that shows you how stock, how high his stock was at, at that particular time and that he was being linked with a with Arsenal, um, his stocks maybe not quite where it was, but I still think he's a very um, good manager. Um, so he plays a factor in, in me thinking that too. But individual quality's got to play a part. Um, the city, I know the games are running out now, but the city grounds, that's got to play a part too, particularly. I know the home record's not been as good this season, has it? But last season, what a major role that played in them staying up. as It felt like that anyway as, as an outsider looking in. Um yeah, and they're, they're just better than Luton. <laughs> they are just better than Luton, so they should stay up. Um, but then, of course, we've got the the unknown of the points deduction situation as well. So yeah, I, that that I can't really give you an answer on. No, no, uh, we're recording this on Monday. We might know by Wednesday when it comes out. It is an X factor. Have you seen, do you see anything in Burnley? You said they were better than Luton. Do you think uh, Burnley, the dark horses, um, they've got very tough fixtures before they play us on the last day? Is that their biggest problem? They've got Newcastle and Spurs. To yeah, play. I mean, I, I I would like to think from what I've seen of these teams this season, I would think that Forrest might well have it done before then. But if it does go down to the final day, that's just like a, I mean, that's a cup final, isn't it? It's, it's, mm -hmm. if, if it ends up like that. So, um, I mean, Burnley, have, I have to say, Burnley have surprised me in recent weeks that they've just about, you know, they've clung on and found some you know, the odd point here and there to get them themselves in a position where they can still stay up. But again, I, I go back to the individual quality across the piece, the experience in the sides as well. Forrest should be staying up ahead of Luton and Burnley. I mean, th there shouldn't really be any argument there when you look at the, the two squads. So, yeah, again, I go back to back in Forrest to stay up, but... Uh, We'll see. Oh gosh, we will. We will. I think they'll stay up. I've said this all season. I think they'll stay up. I've I, I, I wavered a little bit when we couldn't beat Luton away, and but and we played poorly against Everton. But I just think there's enough there. Hopefully, be awful if we went down. Be terrible for the city, but I think we'll be all right. Hopefully, so. Right. If you've enjoyed this, do us a favor: hit like, hit subscribe, give us a good review on iTunes, all the usual uh, appeals, and you can become a channel member. We shall be back tomorrow with our match preview of said Sheffield United game, and then an opposition preview on uh, Friday, and then post match on Saturday. Adam, thank you very much for your time and insights. Uh, You're really appreciate it. You're welcome. Good luck Thanks for the rest of the season. On. What's next for you? What's, what's games next for you? Aston Villa Olympiacos. And then... Oh, well, there you uh, go. That's, that's a Forest connection. Yeah, I've got that on uh, Thursday. And then we've got the National League promotion final on Sunday. It's been switched to Sunday. And that is Bromley, Solly Hull at Wembley. So that should be a good game. And we'll get a, a new member in the EFL, whatever happens there. So that'll be a, a very historic moment for whoever goes up there. God, I used to cover games at Solihull. The crowds were about 300. It's by on the back end of the Jaguar plant, isn't it? It is, yeah. It's in the that's, league, yeah. Yeah, that's exactly where it is, yeah. yeah. They're, both, they're both really well-run clubs. Altingham are as well, who, who got beat yesterday. But uh, then they would have been going into the EFL for the first time. They would have been in the Football League decades ago, but the whole election, when it was... Mm. I mean, still can't believe football actually had that, but they, go, they would have been a Football League side a long time ago. But... Uh, yeah, whichever one goes up, it'll be it'll be a, a fantastic story. Yeah. yeah, if there was an avenue for corruption in English football, which there is, but you never know. But yeah, a football league elections <laughs> sound like they're ripe for <laughs> they were ripe for, for that, weren't they? Yeah. Really? Yeah, yeah. We've moved on since then, or have we? <laughs> hopefully so. Hopefully so. <laughs> right, uh, we'll leave it there. Thanks very much for your time, everyone. Have a good day, and we shall see you soon. <laughs>